1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, these are the words of God. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also do. And now, saints, let us remember that although we will be hated by all on account of Christ's name, the one who endures through to the end shall be saved. Amen. The title of the teaching this morning for our Good Friday service is The Witness and the warning of Christ's crucifixion. Not only was this a public witness to the world, to all of time, to all of human history, in fact, that Christ would lay down his life for his people, it is also a warning for those outside of Christ. So we'll see today both sides, the witness and the warning. I've given it two units of thought this morning as we uh, sort of draw from the text of 1 Thessalonians 5. I won't be exegeting that passage. I'll actually be looking uh, at a, a unique view, a, a chronological view of the six hours of Christ on the cross and dividing them into the first three hours, which I'm going to argue were Christ's sufferings in his body for his people as a witness. Now, Christ suffered the whole six hours on the cross. I understand that. But particularly, I'm wanting to point out this morning something you may not have seen before in the cross, uh, that is Christ suffering in his body for his people as a witness. And then the last three hours where Christ is suffering the wrath of God for his people as a warning. So Christ's uh, crucifixion is a witness to us to continue to suffer for his name's sake, to fill up the sufferings of his body in the church. And it's also a warning of the wrath that he took for us and our main point being that the, Christ, the cross not only divides time and history in two, it points to the great divide that stands between those who are in Christ and the fate of those outside of Christ. I know it's a big line there, but that's why in history it's divided up between BC and AD. It's the way human history is generally divided time. I don't subscribe to that common era. It's blasphemous thinking. I reprobate that thought. There's nothing common about the death of Christ. Amen, everyone? So I never use that phrase or terminology. It really bothers me. Uh, either way, that's just one of the things that could set me off, but we're going to stay with uh, where I'm going this morning, so we'll, we'll keep going with that. Now, uh, let's just look at this really clearly. Maybe before I get to that slide, I'll leave that up there for you note-takers. I want to ask the question, have you ever wondered how long our Lord had to suffer on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. How long? How long was enough? Did it have to be a certain amount of time? Often the question is asked, how can an infinite amount of sins uh, be forgiven in such a short period of time? Well, the answer is Christ is an infinite God. <laughs> he can do infinite much in an infinite short period of time. Uh, were a specific number of hours actually required to redeem those whose sins he would atone for? Moreover, since the Bible goes into specific detail to point out what time Jesus did and said certain things during his crucifixion, this must have some significance. Uh, all of the Bible is profitable, including the chronological references during his crucifixion. So I've looked at that today and I want to take us through uh, two particular sides to the cross that, again, uh, might be uh, sort of... Uh, maybe not familiar to us as, as they might be. We've read them in our Bibles. And so Scripture tells us that it was the ninth hour, oh, sorry, the third hour, or 9 a.m., should I say, when they crucified our Lord. In addition, Mark 15.33 says, at the sixth hour, that's 12 o'clock, so 9 o'clock, Christ is physically crucified. At 12 o'clock, darkness comes over the whole land until the ninth hour, that is 3 o'clock, 
So you can sort of picture that in your mind between 9 o'clock right through to 3 o'clock. So we're at 10 o'clock service. At 9 o'clock, Christ would have been crucified from a time perspective in our own minds. And this goes all the way through to 3 o'clock. So that's quite a long period of time, isn't it? All right, so... uh, of course, people would live on crosses for, for days, but we need to remember here, Christ died so quickly because he was bearing the weight of so much sin and he bore the, the full wrath of God for the sins of his people. That's something that had never been done in human history nor never will be done in human history. Uh, and so it was the ninth hour that when Christ cried out with that loud voice and dismissed his spirit and died, It doesn't take much of a mathematician to work out clearly six hours Jesus was nailed to that cross. Now, we may surmise here, using a little bit of typology and symbology, that six is the number of man. And so those six hours may well symbolise the idea that uh, he was suffering in our place. He bore our sins. Uh, We are healed by his stripes. And so he was a substitutionary atonement. Let's be clear, Jesus didn't have to go to a cross. He didn't have to die for his sins. He died for our sins. And so these six hours are recorded in Scripture uh, for a reason. As I'm going to claim this morning, they give us a great encouragement, a great encouragement to continue to suffer as we take up our cross. And the other point is that it's an awful warning, isn't it, that Christ bore We even sung it this morning. He suffered hell in our place. Up on the screen, I've made it a little bit more clearer for us. You can see uh, some opposing sides here. I'm claiming, uh, and these merge, of course, but I just want you to see them in the categories, all right? So it's not an even split of three hours and three hours, but I just need you to see this, that firstly, in the first three hours that Jesus is a witness of what suffering looks like. So he is showing us what to do when you're suffering. Now, each one of us are called to take up our what? A cross. Now, in the first three hours, I'm claiming that Christ shows us what it is to bear our own cross, what it is to bear through suffering, all right, to, to uh, work through that process in a God-glorifying way like Jesus did without sinning. And then in the last three hours, we'll see a warning of what the coming wrath looks like. Jesus bore our wrath so that we don't have to face it. We see the first three hours are hours of light. We see the last three hours are hours of darkness. We see the first three hours, Christ is our high priest. He is praying. He is looking out for people. He is concerned for the welfare of people. He is acting as a high priest that would go on in the Day of Atonement and uh, shed the blood for his people. And then we see the last three hours, him being a sacrificial lamb. We know the lamb on the altar was burned up, wasn't it? And this is what the burning wrath of God looks like as he burns up his very own son on the cross of Calvary with the burning wrath of God. We know that when the vials are poured out in the book of Revelation, the church will be gone because the wrath is being poured out. The church doesn't suffer the wrath of God because Christ took it in our place. Amen, everyone? And so when the wrath is being poured out in the book of Revelation, I think it's 16 and so on, uh, you're going to see the the fire really begin to consume uh, people. And then, of course, we've got uh, what we've been saved to. That is, as Christians, we've been saved to suffer for his name's sake. And what we've been saved from in the last three hours, of course, we've been saved from hell. We've been saved from an eternal damnation which is good news, everyone. But it is a warning for those still outside of Christ while the cross is available, while repentance and the time of repentance and the day of salvation is still available, uh, that we should run to him. So just like the cross unites all who come to Christ from every different tribe and tongue and nation, yet it also not only unites, but it what? It divides between each side, between uh, the saved and the unsaved, the light and the darkness. Christ not only came to unite us in the sacrifice of himself, he came to bring a sword. He would divide those away who rejected him. And so the cross is a wonderful symbol both of unity and of division in the sense that you are either for Christ or you are against him. This is the dividing line and always will be through all of humanity right up until the final judgment. 
What you do with the crucifixion of Christ and his death in history will determine your eternal destiny. I'm going to say that one more time. What you do with the crucifixion of Christ and his death in history will determine your eternal destiny. That's a big thought, isn't it? What will you do with the cross? The real, factual Jesus who died on a real Roman cross. A cross that was designed by God from the foundation of the world. It was always God's plan to send his son to die for the sins of his people. John MacArthur says it this way. All men are divided at the cross, both in eternity and in time. C.S. Lewis, I know he's not a theologian, but a great quote, again, really pointing to where we're going today. The cross of Christ means either immortal horrors or everlasting splendours. Wow. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendours. Can there be any more of, of a divergence than that? Let's get to our text today. 9am, the third hour, Jesus is crucified. Of course, we're to take up our cross and follow him. We're going to learn some lessons here. But at the third hour, Mark 15, 25, it was the third hour when they crucified him. So what does a Christian do when they suffer? Well, we do what Christ does. What's the first thing Jesus does after he is hung up on the cross? He prays. Dear Christian, when we're going through suffering, we should pray. And we pray for the people who are inflicting that suffering. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Prayer is the first response of Christ in sufferings and not only, not any prayer, but prayer for his enemies. Christ has his wits clearly about him. He's praying for his enemies. If you're racked with pain, if that was the pain you were going through, not that it had to be as a Christian, but what Christ bore for you, you'd be so self-consumed with your own pain. I mean, some of us just cut our finger and it's all about me. Christ is here, nails, crown of thorns, the, the, you know, through his hands and feet. He's been whipped, beaten. Think of the smashing he got, the whipping he got before he even got to the cross. And yet he is praying for those around him. And his prayer is so powerful. We know that he prays, Father, forgive them. Listen to the prayer and the contents of the prayer. Father, forgive them. Indeed, that prayer will be answered within hours because there will be people like the centurion that look to Christ, are watching Jesus, have the earthquake and everything happening around them, and they're saying, truly, this, I mean, the people that crucified him are saying, he saved me. Truly, this was the Son of God. Now, we don't know explicitly here that the centurion is actually getting saved, but testimony is clearly pointing to the fact that people are giving witness to who, acknowledging who Christ really is. This is the Son of God. I wonder, do we know when we're going through suffering what it is to pray for our enemies or just get angry with them? Or do we revile back with those who revile us? So this is our first point. At 10 a.m., Jesus is insulted and mocked. Jesus is insulted and mocked. We see the people there at the cross mocking him and uh, claiming, uh, shaking their heads and shouting abuse. It's the verbal abuse as well that Christ has to take. You can destroy the temple and build it again in three days, can you? Well, then if you are the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, aren't you the Christ, the Messiah, the one who should come? What has this amounted to is the accusational claim there by the criminal on the cross. I want you to notice that all of those insults point and revolve around the, the truthless uh, claims, the truth Sorry, let me read from my notes. The timeless claims of what the devil hates about Christianity. Come down and save yourself. Salvation is in Christ alone. Insults against the Jews, against the temple. You said you would destroy the temple and build it again. 
The devil hates the church, the building of the church, which Christ would, of course, do. The temptation against Christ's divinity. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Messiah, save yourself. Consistently tempting. That was the temptation in the wilderness, wasn't it? If you are the Son of God, it's still going on here, the temptation uh, that uh, the enemy comes uh, to us with and, of course, to the Lord Jesus. It's amazing to think that even in suffering for the right things, the devil will tempt Christ and will tempt even us when we're suffering for the right things, to justify yourself. And Jesus didn't retort to any of those things. Uh, if he would have, he would have shortcutted the process that the Father had for, for us. If Christ fell for this temptation, I want you to think about this for a minute. If Christ fell for this temptation and came down from the cross and saved himself, he would have saved himself, but the purpose he was up there for was to save us, not himself and all of redemptive history would have been undermined he would have saved himself but his purpose he was up there to save you dear friend and so he couldn't save himself not yet that sunday so you got to come back for that where he resurrects himself from the grave but the point here being our lord does save himself in due course in three days later we get that but jesus is clearly pointing here to the fact that he must suffer on behalf of his people and, of course, he's modelling for us, Christian, the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, we also see what we should do in Jesus' act of silence and non-responsiveness to these temptations. He is saving his energy for these next two things that we're going to see. Uh, he's saving himself... Firstly, for evangelizing the criminal. So up on the cross there, you've got two people being crucified alongside Jesus. The first one is hurling insults at him. The second one, uh, Jesus uh, is responding to. Now in Luke chapter 23, verses 40 through 43, for time's sake, we're not turning to these verses, obviously, but I'm referencing them to you in the PowerPoints uh, for this will be on the YouTube channel. Testimony of the criminals is ominous, isn't it? And with him, they crucified two thieves, one on his right and the other on his left. So there you go. You've got two types of people in all of human history. Uh, the events of that day will show you that indeed people will be categorised on two sides, one that will remain unsaved, who will mock Christ to the end and will not repent, one on the other side who acknowledges who Christ is and will ultimately uh, be in heaven with the Lord on that day. Just as the criminals were both guilty, so all men are guilty before Christ who will be their judge on the final day. Dear friend, that is you up there from a symbolic sense. You deserve crucifixion. Your sins deserve death. The point now is, which side will you end on? Will you end on the one that confesses Christ and your subsequent physical death will end up being with Christ in paradise or being separated him from him forever? We know the uh, verse here where the nations are separated. All nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as the ship, uh, shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the cross will separate people. We see that. There will be a separation based on the event or your response to the cross. We know that uh, we're guilty. And yet we see these men. And I want to point you now to the thief who God does a wonderful work of grace in. Although they represent us, they are proven guilty by their own sins, they deserve death. Yet suddenly, by God's grace, one is given eyes to see, a heart to fear, a tongue to confess. This is how salvation works. God does it sovereignly, doesn't he? Plainly, the criminal was not seeking Christ. 
He was consumed with the fact that he had been proven guilty, he is going to be crucified, and he, his last breath is coming very quickly. But a few minutes before his death, God mercifully changes his heart towards the God-man on the cross, a few feet away from him, from hatred and insults to becoming a God-fearing man who sees the innocence of Christ as he suffers the just for the unjust. Don't you fear God, he says, since you are under the same sentence to the other thief he's speaking to. We are punished justly for what we are getting for our deeds deserve this. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now there's a Christian confession. He knows he's a God-man bleeding on the cross. He knows he's a man dying, yet the God-man. And then he prays for the first and last time in his life. One prayer, one and only prayer in your whole life. Don't tell me God is not gracious, that you get to go to heaven and the only prayer you pray is one prayer just before you die. Do not tell me God is not gracious. And so he prays, Jesus, listen to his prayer, Jesus with some of the last words he will ever speak in his human body. Jesus, the name, the only name by which man can be saved. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He calls him a saviour and he calls him a king. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. What sweet words they must have been to hear as the thief was literally probably ready to resign up his spirit right there and then as he hears those wonderful words of rejoicing. This is a proof that Jesus Christ is merciful in how he saves many people. Many people. All of their lives they have lived a life of a criminal taking and thieving and robbing from others. And in the last moment of their life, before going to an eternal hell which they deserved, Christ mercifully awakens the dead sinner to new life in him and gives them an eternal home in glory with him. You think about it for a minute. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Do you know what heaven is? It's not just a place. Heaven is being with him. That's what heaven is, dear saints. People who have wanted nothing to do with Jesus all of their life and are unrepentant till the day of their death don't want to spend eternity with Christ. They want the other option and therefore consigned to the other option. I don't have time for this, but Jesus also looks down from the cross to Mary, his mother, and John. Now, Mary represents his physical family and John represents his spiritual family family he calls them son and mother and hands his mother over to the care of John his son his spiritual son and he treats them as spiritual family we know John takes Mary away to Ephesus that's where they live out the last of their days and this is what we in our suffering are called to also do is not to be so self-consumed with our own issues that we separate ourselves but even from the cross Jesus is modeling for us saints that we should be looking out for others in the church caring for others in the church but what about this person but what about that person and I pray even on your deathbed you're concerned about other people not yourself this is what Christ models for us may the Lord give us grace to do and act in these ways as we should as Christians and not be so self-absorbed like the world. Amen, everyone. Well, let's go to the last three hours. 12 noon, the sixth hour, darkness covers the land, Mark 15, 33. The last three hours, immediately the situation changes as light becomes darkness. Could there be any more of a change than light becoming darkness? And we're not just talking darkness here. We're talking pitch black darkness. What's happening? The horrors of the reality of the earth's groaning since the inception of sin are beginning to reveal the enormity of what Christ is suffering as he bears God's full wrath and anger for, sins, for the sins of those he is dying and bearing for. Jesus is literally suffering what hell will be like on behalf of his people, so we don't have to bear this torment and suffering ourselves. Do you get the enormity of that? 
Christ is suffering the wrath that we deserved. It's incredible, very sobering. This is why Jesus is called indeed the suffering servant. He is serving you, dear Christian, by suffering in your place. Because he suffered hell in our place that we might go to heaven instead. You think I'm being a bit too dramatic? The verse for you is Psalm 16, verse 10. Jesus himself, it is prophesied, will cry out and acknowledge, Father, you will not leave my soul in hell. Hades. Christ is literally suffering what it would be like for you to be in hell in your place. The first thing we see about hell, the hell that Christ suffered on our behalf, is that hell will be a terrible place of darkness. We've got a picture up there sort of depicting that. For those in hell, the light has passed. The era of eternal darkness has now come. Darkness is a picture of judgment. For three hours, the land of Jerusalem is cloaked with thick darkness as a sign of God's wrath and judgment upon the sins that deserved hell with Christ, which Christ is bearing for his people. If we go back to the book of Exodus, before death came, what happened? Darkness clouded the ancient city of Egypt as the death angel began to move in and take the lives of the firstborn. In this case, God's firstborn son, his life is being taken from him and as darkness covers the land, the firstborn. Of course, those who had life were those who slayed the firstborn lamb and put the blood of the lintels over their doorposts and they were saved from the wrath that was to come for the Egyptians. Jesus calls the place of uh, hell in Matthew 8, 12 and Jude 13, the place of outer darkness. In Jude, in Jude he calls it the blackness of darkness forever where you will be bound hand and foot. You will not be able to escape, is the picture there, with no hope of return, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place of darkness, a place of weeping, where people's teeth are grinding, spiritually grinding, because there is no hope of escape. This outer darkness is outside of all light. All natural light, all man-made light, all spiritual light, all God-given light, all the light of the gospel, all the light of the hope, all the light of peace, and all the light of pardon. For those who remain unrepentant, for those who waited too long to make things right with God, who realise their fate has been sealed by their own words from the book of Job. These are haunting words, Job 17, 13. If I wait, hell is my house, and I have made my bed in darkness. At one o'clock, Jesus cries out to the Father in pitch black. Eli, Eli, Laba, Lama, Sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This will be the terrible cry of the damned as they enter hell and come to the awful reality that they have rejected Christ and are forsaken by God. They have denied the Son. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine the scene in a loud voice in pitch black darkness? Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know why he's crying that? Because he is experiencing what it is to be forsaken by God. The light of his father's presence was gone. And the reality of this, in the reality of this, the son cries out to his father. Indeed, it is the prayer of the forsaken. It will also be the prayer of the damned as they realize their awful fate. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is it not true instinctively when you see people watch tragedies or disasters unfold on YouTube or on TV, you hear the voice of the videographer going, my God, oh my God. In the same way as people reach their final fate in hell, that will be the same claim. Oh my God, my God. I'm forsaken. This horrible reality. And then why, why, 
Why didn't I repent in time? Why didn't I just humble myself and bow the knee and acknowledge Christ as my saviour, my foolish pride that has damned me to these dark pits while I had hope and now all hope is gone. Archibald Brown says of this moment, O brethren, if you want to measure the deep horrors of the lost, you must measure them by the cross of Christ. It is his groans, his tears, his cries, which best tell what hell means. Your breaking heart, Lord Jesus, your flowing blood, your death cry of my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the things that say to me more than anything else, there is a dreadful judgment to come upon the sinner for his sins. Spurgeon says no plea or prayer, no tears and excuses shall be able to avail in this time. In darkness you will hear the yells and the cries, the weeping and the gnarling of the forever lost. End quote. In this hour, Jesus also thirsted. John tells us that he was thirsty. John 19, 28 and 29. Hell is a dry place, a thirsty place. It is this way because it is a hot place. Brimstone and torment. This was the rich man's first reaction as the angels took him to Hades. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am agony in this flame. Couldn't you send him just... Uh, couldn't you send him to give me just a little relief? MacArthur says of this event, he would give Lazarus, that is the rich man, he wouldn't even give him a crumb, but he wanted Lazarus to give him a drip. The souls of the damned know they're doomed to suffer. They know they are suffering justly. All they ask for in this man's lips are some small moments of relief in this eternal, unending horror. Real water is not going to soothe an eternally tortured soul. This is not the point. The message is the desperation of the damned for, the, for just the smallest moment of relief. This is the image of hell. At two o'clock, Jesus cries out, It is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. For those doomed in hell, it is also finished. Hell is a place of finality. All hope is lost. There will be no more offers of the gospel like you will hear today, dear friend. There will be no more pleas for you to repent or have your sins forgiven. The time of salvation would have passed. We all know the feeling when we think all hope is gone. But this will be a moment for those who are committed eternally to the confines of Hades. That is an awful uh, reality that they have never, of course, experienced. Their souls committed and therefore confined into the hands of demons to be tormented for eternity. Dear saints, I hope this is gripping us this morning as I've uh, just planned and projected the, the words of uh, the scriptures and just these vivid pictures uh, to help us to remember not what Christ suffered for us, but how we should be evangelizing and uh, reminding people of the awful fate if they don't turn to Christ. Finally, at three o'clock, the ninth hour, Jesus dies. He tastes death in its awful finality that we may know life in him. He hangs his head and gives up his spirit. Our Savior has borne the sins of his people in six hours. Every sin every Christian will ever commit, past, present and future, has been borne by the eternal Son of God on that cross. He has become a curse that we might be blessed. He has suffered death in our place as a witness that hell has come to earth in those very few hours. History records Christ as a real man, Calvary as a real place, and the cross as factual. These facts call each of us to consider what we will do with Christ today. Will we look to him? Will we see Jesus? who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man? Is that person you today? Christian, the challenge is, do you recognize, maybe with a fresh look today, for all that the Lord Jesus has borne on the cross for you, that he suffered in your place, that you might know the light and joy and peace of being with him in paradise? And to the unbeliever, who I hope is sobered this morning, because you know now that the gospel 
the only way to salvation is through Christ, would you, like the thief, turn to Christ and say, Jesus, remember me, forgive me, save me, forgive me of my sins, that he might save and forgive and redeem you for himself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll come to the Lord's table. Well, Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for Jesus and for the cross that our Lord became a witness to how we should take up our cross and suffer for his name's sake, but that he also became a warning to us that we were deserving of God's wrath and hell, and yet by an act of pure mercy and grace, Christ bore our guilt and our sin that we might get to heaven rather than be doomed to hell. Lord, how can we thank you enough for what you have done? We give you all the praise and all the glory for your magnificent sacrifice and for saving us who are deserving of death. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.